across the U.S., we've underbuilt housing by over 7 million units, and 3.5 million of those exist in California. About a little over five years ago now, the state of California, for lack of a better word, legalized ADU statewide. What that means, they said, if you are a property owner, residential property owner, you have the legal right to build an ADU on your property by right, through ministerial approval. That means neighbors can't throw up challenges to your project. That means local planning commissions can't throw up challenges. A new slate of laws that took effect in 2020 extended that even further, to which the framework is if your structure is underneath 16 feet tall, if it is under 800 square feet, and if you are four feet off your rear inside property line, you have the legal right to build. And that's a fascinating framework for housing, particularly in a state like California, where some of the biggest barriers to housing are neighborhood comment periods, CEQA reviews, planning commission challenges, city council challenges. Those are now illegal by state law. We quite often get compared to Wizard of Oz with the flying home. We're adding some of this gentle density to these communities that haven't seen new homes in decades. And I think at its core, we're attacking that supply problem one backyard at a time. We're based in Redwood City because it's an area that is smack dab in one of the nation's largest housing crises. Housing prices within a 20 mile radius of where we are right now are astronomically high. This is our very first showroom here in Redwood City. We have two of our Abodu models in here, our Abodu One, which is our 500 square foot, one bedroom, one bath, kind of our flagship home. Behind me over here is our Bodu Studio, which is a 340 square foot, but a bit smaller uh, of a structure, one bathroom, more of a studio layout. Our Bodu One was actually our very first product designed to be kind of that optimal 500 square foot ADU size. The studio was built in response to folks that had a bit smaller backyards, couldn't fit the Bodu One in. So we said, well, how can we build a smaller product that would allow to fit that in your backyard? So this is our Bodu Studio. If you'll notice we have our folding door here, which creates quite a big opening barrier into the deck. Really introduces that indoor-outdoor living that you can have in California. Is that one of the bigger costs? Uh, it is. The folding doors, turns out, they aren't cheap. And so we do offer them as an option, right, for folks that decide they want to build out that exterior space. On our studio here, you'll also see our classic stained cedar siding. It's a beautiful, natural look that really ties to that kind of coastal California architecture. A lot of people ask us, what's going on with the roof design? It's a really intricate roof program that was designed to add space where you need it most. So if you notice, the high points of the roof are where you use the space most often, but also it creates this sense of volume in the unit, right? So it really lofts those ceilings up, creates that cathedral feel. It's not even straight in the middle. Yeah. It's like, right? So it's called a diagonal gable roof. Essentially what you take is a standard gable roof and you offset it slightly. So a couple of things here. It creates architectural intrigue, right? You come in and you say, well, this is interesting. And it's one of the first things people notice when they walk in a Bodu and they're kind of wrapping their brains around it. But that's what we want, right? We don't want to build housing that's uninspiring or housing that is, you know, traditional of, of California housing stop that was slapped together back in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. While that's important, uh, it's not all that intriguing. So when we set out to design a Bodu, we really focus on how do we add a little bit of art to each unit that we're building. But you can't get too crazy, right? You can't be landing spaceships in people's backyards. It has to be something that people see as familiar. Another key hallmark is our ample natural light. So you'll notice each Abodu unit has this light well that goes across the entire length of the unit so that no matter where you are, you're always finding ways for your eyes to go outside of the unit, making the space feel much larger. So it's, it's important it's kind of lined up. Yep, so it's a perfect line in all of our products. A couple other hallmarks of our studio here, which every Abodu unit comes with, is a full kitchen. That means a full-size fridge freezer. That means a dishwasher. That means a garbage disposal, uh, as well as a four-burner uh, induction cooktop and a 24-inch electric oven. So everything's full-size. Everything's full-size. And, and it comes, like, when you bring the crane in, it has this in it? Yep. So when we bring the crane in, everything you see in here is installed except for the furniture. Cabinets, appliances, flooring, windows, walls, whole nine yards fully complete on delivery day. So in our studio back here, uh, we currently have it staged with a Murphy bed hybrid couch. We thought it was really important to show how you could make this 340 square foot ADU quite modular. We really designed our space to be lived in. 
take a few cushions down, fold the bed down. That took 90 seconds. Really not that bad. Right. And you right. can still walk by. You can still walk by, still got the space. And it pulls you right back to the bathroom area here. So a couple other things. All of our units have the option to go with a washer dryer unit. So we've hidden a 220 volt combined washer dryer unit deck here and really just integrated well with the space. It doesn't take up any square footage that wasn't already used for it. As we come into the bathroom here, you'll notice we found a way to make the bathroom footprint really tight yet make it feel quite big. Wow, the shower's quite big. Right? Shower. Oh yeah, big full size shower. So it's 42 by 42 inches, which uh, is about the, the smallest we think that's really fair to use. You can go quite smaller actually, but it's quite a big usable space, right? And we think that's really important to that livability of each unit. <laughs> so standard electric panel hookup that runs through the interior of the wall down to the foundation and connects up to a main home's electric panel. It connects to the main home. Yeah. We try and avoid uh, working with new utility services as much as possible. We find that saves homeowners quite a bit of money, as well as time. So typically after delivery, it takes about two weeks of on-site work. What we're doing here is we're connecting the unit to the foundation itself, connecting up the sewer, water, and electric utilities, getting that final inspection from the city. But after those about two weeks, ready to be lived in. When it comes to prefab, there's a lot of ways that prefabricated structures can be considered. Really the two primary are real property or personal property. Real property is when something is connected to the earth and is considered part of that parcel. It's when you're looking at a single family home, you're looking at a duplex, a quad, that's all real property because it's built on a foundation. Personal property is something like a car. It's movable, it's not necessarily tethered to land. Oftentimes things like tiny homes on wheels or prefabricated park models that are on trailers still, that's considered personal property. Really challenging to finance personal property, really challenging to insure personal property versus real property. So at the very beginning, when we were building out of Bodu, we thought it was very important to be building real property for folks. Now that means we're putting a concrete foundation in every backyard we work in. We also have to run to local utilities, sewer, water, and electric. So the beauty is we stub all the sewer, water, and electric connections into the middle of the foundation before delivery day. Unit gets delivered on top of the foundation, and then after delivery, we go into that crawl space, make those connections to sewer, water, and electric with the unit itself, so that that unit is no different than that main home on the property, right? And then when you resell, it's... When you resell, this unit is part of that parcel, right? So we've already had a couple homes trade with the Bodus in that backyard. And traditionally, it gets valued as just additional square footage on that main home. The cost for a project like this is typically the second largest investment a family ever makes behind their main home. So you have to think about how can that property owner think of this like an investment instead of buying a luxury car or something that will depreciate in value. Oh, you guys got it. Nice. Big step, big step. So it works like a house and not like a car. Exactly. That was intentional from the beginning. How homes for better or for worse are a gigantic stores of wealth and savings for families right across America. It's just the system that's been developed and the system that plays out today. And so if we can help homeowners add to that store value on their property, we think that's significantly better than having an approach that watches that value get destroyed over time with depreciation. So now in California, you can build anywhere as long as you're four feet from the property line. Yeah, so even just five years ago, setbacks were not standardized across California, which means individual jurisdictions could set their own setback rules. That means if we're working in Los Angeles, it could be five foot setbacks from the rear and side property lines. But if we're working in Santa Monica, it could be 25 feet from the rear and side, right? This patchwork of regulations was really, really challenging for homeowners to interpret. And what the state of California has done is really try to translate that into a standardized framework that is easy for homeowners to understand. So now you could be pretty close to the property line. Right? We can be up to four feet in most cities. And some cities have even brought that down further, but the most cities can enforce this four feet off of that side and rear property line. So we had to think about that in the design process. How do we limit the exposure of your livability to that backyard neighbor, but also make sure that backyard neighbor has a lot of privacy from this unit. So our window profile in each of our units is highly considered, right? We're looking for ways to make sure we're building privacy both into the livability of the space of the Abodu, but also the main homes parcel and the neighbor's parcel. So you'll notice on our Abodu one here, a lot of our windows are on the front facade. These are all going back into the backyard. 
However, in the bedroom, we don't have any low front facing windows, only a tall window for natural light. That creates a lot more privacy between the main home and the dwellers of the Abodu. When we look at the neighbor side as well, we only have one window on the rear elevation that is typically covered with window coverings, right? So a small amount of light that we let in from the back, but really trying to deliver that privacy to the back neighbor. How often does it happen that you're up against a big fence here or something where you, this would be blocked? The majority of the time. In terms of being right near a side fence, yeah. right? We're working in backyards, so there's yeah. typically a fence four to five feet away from this window. The good news is, right, we always try and take that privacy into consideration. So a lot of folks put window coverings here just to prevent any issues, but you still have that natural light coming from up top. So a couple of other things you'll notice about our, uh, our Bodu One is this one has a dedicated living space. A couple things you'll notice. Our diagonal gable roof gives a lot of space over the dining area where you spend a lot of time, but also brings that height right through the kitchen. This unit, our Bodu One, also has a designated kitchen setup, right? This is a small footprint kitchen, but with counter space left and right, ton of cabinets, countertops. We even snuck our washer dryer combo unit in here. You never know where that's gonna show up. Never know where it's gonna show up, right? But it's always as little space as possible. And similar to what we saw in the studio, we have a full-size fridge freezer setup. We have a full-size four burner induction cooktop, electric oven, and exterior vented hood. And it's interesting you decided to kind of make it just the hallway. I mean, the kitchen is like, yeah. Leverage every inch of space, right? We're working with 500 square feet here. 14 feet by 35 feet roughly. That's not much space. So every single inch has to be utilized really well. You'll also notice, where's the high point of the ceiling in this room? So when you lie down at bed at night, the high point of the ceiling is right over where your eyes are. It makes the ceiling feel so far away and just makes the space feel overall a lot bigger, right? Another thing that we do offer is we stub out for ceiling fans. Maybe you don't want it now, but maybe you want it in five years. Tearing up your roof and your ceiling to get that done is a challenging endeavor. So we try and build that flexibility into each space. We come into the bathroom here. You'll notice another quite big shower that is large enough and usable without uh, feeling too tight. Yet the footprint we're talking about for this bathroom is really, really small. Do you have to think at all about craning things in and like the materials you use for the craning process? Yes, right? So when we're craning our homes in, there's a lot of stress and strain and torque on them. So, you know, things like how do we think about the tile or how do we think about the flooring or how do we think about the countertops all went into those decisions. The good news is we're able to attack a lot of that from the structural integrity of the, of the building itself, right? So having done a couple hundred of these at this point, we really nailed that down to understand where do we fear or see uh, failure points in, in craning. Oddly enough, the smallest point we typically see is in the corner of where the roof meets the wall. I would say the vast majority of times we see a couple little hairline cracks just come down the drywall. So now as part of our home close-up process, we come in, sand that down, make sure it's covered up, repaint that wall, make sure it's all taken care of. So do you have the feeling that as you go, you know more and more about the product? Absolutely. Uh, the very first 10 homes we put in, we had to learn a lot about that, right? What is the process like? Where are the challenges? Where do we learn what we don't even know? I mean, we're well over 100 homes in the ground now across California and Washington where we've built that process out in a way that is scalable and repeatable. This, it shows the projects we've worked on in the Pacific Northwest, in Southern California, as well as our Northern California region, right? If you think about it, the markets that really lend themselves to strong ADU adoption are markets where they've seen significant increase in housing costs. Unfortunately, that is most of the United States over the past few years. Is there anywhere that you can't put in an ADU? Uh, actually, the California Coastal Commission has jurisdiction along the coast all the way along down the state here. And there are some pockets of the Coastal Commission that make it really challenging to build ADUs. So who's buying ADUs? What type of scenarios do you look at most? So when you look at overall ADUs, the market as a whole, it's, it's roughly 50% build for rental income, 50% build for loved ones or family members. When we look at our customers, almost 40% of our customers build for rental income. And that can be owner occupied rental income. So I live in my main home and I rent out the backyard. Or it can be, I'm an investor and I own this investment property and I'm putting this in for a second stream of rental income off that property. But 60% of our customer base is multi-generational households, right? I've got that three bed, two bath home and my parents are moving in with me. Or you know what, I've done the math and my debt service on an Abodu is one fifth the cost of an assisted living facility. So 
So I'd actually rather have my folks move into my backyard to provide childcare and, and save a little money at the same time, right? Suddenly you have, you know, grandparents, parents, and kids all living within the same four walls that can start to feel a little claustrophobic, right? That's not ingrained in American culture. And so I think you started to see folks looking for other solutions to that problem, right? But I don't think that's going away. I think people realize it's doable and wow, it actually makes the economics of family living make quite a bit of sense. If only they had a designated living space for mom and dad or a designated living space for the kids, right? I think that's something that is being normalized again. And I don't expect that to go away anytime soon just because the economics of it make so much sense. And one of, probably one of the victories of ADUs is the fact that they are not perceived as something scary or awkward, right? Yes. I think what's most fascinating about ADUs is it's one of the housing typologies that everyone can get on board with right? Local jurisdictions look at this and say, well, this is great. We can add needed housing units to our area. Homeowners win because they're adding property value into their backyard, right? Whether they're using it for loved ones and family members or rental income, that's property value. So they get to win from that. And local tenants and renters get to win right now. They suddenly have access to housing in these neighborhoods that were previously impossible to enter. And so I think what's really fascinating is we're unlocking these neighborhoods, unlocking these school districts for folks that never had access to that before. And I, I think the big piece there is you don't have to, to handle any of the land cost. The land already exists. It's just not being used to its highest and best potential. At its core, California has seen substantial success with ADUs over the past few years here. Last year, when over 25,000 ADUs were built in California. That's a significant amount of housing. When you look at the city of Los Angeles' building permits, a little over 20% of them are for ADUs. That is substantial. Other states, other metros, other municipalities are looking at the success California has had with ADUs and saying, maybe we should do the same. You know, I think five years from now, we're gonna see significantly more states that have statewide legislative frameworks that are basically carbon copies of California.